This podcast is brought to you by Cash App, the easy way to send, spend, save, and invest with friends. Does everyone in your friends group have a cash tag? That's money. And because Cash App connects you effortlessly with your friends and your finances, I would like to take this moment to shout out all the friends who are on Cash App. Shout out to the friend whose cash tag is learning to bake and to the one who helped you take your AC out of your window. A big shout out to the friend who owes you $38.42. Shout out to the friend who will only pay you back in Bitcoin and the one who always suggests theme restaurants. Shout out to the old friend who instilled a fear of mana rays in you that you can't shake. And I'd like to shout out my brother-in-law who constantly cash apps me the most ridiculous sums of money, $11.42 for a bagel and cream cheese that I bought him. He doesn't need to do that, Kylie but he does. This. Kylie <laughs> loves this shout out. We also uh, should shout out the new friend who recently started working in real estate and now says location, location, location all the time. Shout out to the friend who withhold repayment until you finally agree that who's the greatest of all time? Um, It's got to be Leo, right? We can do Leo for now. I think Leo <laughs> works. And to the friend who can't dance. Shout out to the friend who sends gift reactions entirely too much for anyone's taste, JJ. And to the friend who thinks you're related. And to the friend who drew their cat on their custom cash card. Shout out to you, sir. I am a giffer. Cash App is the easy way for you and all your friends to enjoy sending, spending, saving, investing, splitting, tipping, donating, gifting, or just pressing buttons to look busy, all with the number one finance app in the App Store. That's money. That's Cash App. Download Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today to create your own cash tag. Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 133, Tyrese Halliburton, Mailbag Edition. We haven't done one, done one of these mailbags in a long time, Tommy. They're always fun. I'm, I'm of course, biased to our listeners and to our viewers. Uh, you guys are one of the most intelligent basketball communities around. I was so impressed by the uh, quality of questions that we got, and we got into some really in-depth discuss discussions around this NBA season. Yeah, the questions were great, and I would say just keep them coming um, because we will do more of these, and we really like engaging with you guys in this way. Uh, one thing I want to mention: um, we, you know, we are we are working hard over here at the Old Man of the Three and at Three Four Two. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, just a reminder. We have a newsletter, a farewell to takes that comes out every Monday. It's very easy to, to subscribe. You can go to our social platforms. There's an easy subscribe button. If you already follow us on social, please go hit subscribe. The newsletter is free. There's a lot of fun stuff in there. Uh, we also are doing a an exclusive weekly episode every Monday, The Old Man and the Three Things, where we deep dive on three pertinent topics around the NBA. This week, we talked about the Warriors' struggles, we talked about Memphis having a second star, and we talked about Cam Johnson's injury and the implications of that. It's a really fun, nuanced discussion. It's only available on Amazon Music for subscribers there. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say, based on this episode, uh, with Tyrese and the mailbag. Tommy, again, we got some great questions. The one team we really didn't touch on in this mailbag, and we haven't spent a ton of time talking about them so far this year, is the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah. Well, first of all, we need to shout out our, our boy, Josh Hart. Yep. The game winner in Miami a couple of days ago. Knox was very excited when he woke up the next morning to watch it. He's big on buzzer beaters, especially game winning buzzer beaters. What are your What are your thoughts now that now that Dame is back and they and they uh, you know they Seemed to keep it afloat without him for the for a couple of games he was out. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting things ha about this team. First of all, they're seven and three. They're a game out of first place, uh, tied with the Utah Jazz, the Phoenix Suns. I look at the loss column. They're tied with the Utah Jazz, the Phoenix Suns, and the Denver Nuggets and the Dallas Mavericks with three losses. This is clearly a very competent basketball team. I think both of us had them in the 9-10 play-in slot when we did our preseason predictions. Yep. They've certainly looked more competent as a basketball team than, say, the Minnesota Timberwolves or the Clippers. I think this is a legitimate playoff team. Uh, so I go back to 2018, right? That was the year they made the conference finals with Dame and C.J. McCollum. And, you know, C.J.'s gone, but Anthony Simons, we talk about him uh, with Tyrese. I, I think he's got a legit case to make an all-star game this year. He's been fantastic. But if you look at their wing depth in 2018, it was Mo Harkless and Al Farouk Amino. Those guys really couldn't shoot the basketball. They, they they get to the playoffs, and they're doubling Dame. They're doubling CJ. 
and they're leaving those guys open. And they tried to to add more shooting. And, you know, Dame gets hurt last year and they they really had sort of hit a rut. And they've rebuilt with guys like Jeremy Grant, with guys like Josh Hart. Uh, Justice Winslow, who who can't shoot the basketball, has been fantastic on the defensive end. It looks like they hit with their draft pick this year with Shaden Sharp. He's been great. I mean, Jeremy Grant's shooting almost five threes a game and is hitting 44% of his threes. I was going to say, don't you feel like Jeremy Grant was a, for whatever reason, was a slept on acquisition this summer? I, I, I don't know if it was Nate Jones, but it was somebody on Twitter uh, tweeted this out. You know, Jeremy Grant was underutilized in the Denver offense, overutilized, essentially not in a perfect role, probably a role that was a little too large for him in Detroit. And to me, he's sort of in that perfect slot offensively, you know, 10 to 15 shots a game. He's a tertiary creator. Kylie, you like that word tertiary? Yep. Yep. Not the first option, not the second option, maybe the third option. You like that. Um, and he, he, so he's, he's been, he's been efficient this year and I like him in this role. I don't know that he was slept on. I think, I think a lot of people were like, why did you leave Denver? You know, clearly the bag, obviously yeah. the bag had something to do with it. A larger offensive role. I get that part to me. He's in a great spot right here. Um, here's the thing about the Blazers. That's really interesting. Tommy, according to DraftKings Sportsbook, the best teams against the spread, the trailblazers are tied with the Cavaliers eight and two, which means they covered the spread best team against the spread. Most profitable team people that made uh, the most money on bets on teams. Trailblazers are fifth. Bucks, Jazz, Cavaliers, Bulls, one through four. Trailblazers are fifth. I'm confused about this. The latter point. I don't understand why the Bucks are the most profitable team. I think the Bucks Safe are the best. bets, baby. Bucks are the best team in the league. <laughs> but well, here. So I think the, the other thing we wanted to talk about uh, with some of these splits is the Western Conference final splits with the Blazers because there's a pretty interesting number there if you wanted to go over that. Yeah. So the Blazers right now. Their odds to win the Western Conference. And again, this is a team that with a similar roster, but now with more shooting and and, and I, I think more wing depth, period, uh, that made made the conference finals. The Portland Trailblazers are plus 2,500. Those are their odds right now who else to win the West, who Western else, Conference. Who else is plus 2,500 just for comparison? The Lakers, <laughs> who look like a disaster again. <laughs> like, so I, that's that's a great bet. Those are great odds. Uh, if you want to take a flyer on the Blazers to win the Western Conference. Again, you can find all of this information uh, at DraftKings on DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, download the app. Uh, please see show notes for details. There's a lot of rules and regulations around sports betting. So see show notes for details. Um, in terms of the other teams, uh, real quick, I know we got to wrap in a second. The other, the, the other best teams against the spread. Um, what are your feeling? What's your feeling on uh, the Jazz and the Raptors here? Well, look, I love the Raptors. We talked about them a ton last year. It's largely the same core group of guys. Um, the Jazz have been the big surprise. And Tommy, you just teed me up. You teed me up because this is a perfect segue into our conversation with Tyrese Halliburton, where we talk a lot about the Utah Jazz and a lot about their breakout star, Lori Markkinen. So let's get to it. Our conversation and our mailbag with Tyrese Halliburton. All right, let's welcome in Tyrese Halliburton. We have a very special mailbag episode, an early NBA season mailbag episode with the OG correspondent Tyrese Halliburton. Ty, thanks for joining us, man. Yep, glad to be back. First cool. video in the new game room. Yep, you see it, you see it. We're, we're coming along, we're coming along. Uh, Tommy, I know you know this, but uh, Tyrese, TJ and I, TJ McConnell and I, had a uh, a dinner date planned uh, last Sunday when the Pacers were in town to play the Nets, and Ty and Jade were a, a nice last minute addition to it. Um, but from what I understand, you're making moves in Indy. That's all I'm saying. That you're making moves in Indy right now. <laughs> yeah, for sure, no question about it. Uh, we've got some awesome questions. So we reached out to you guys on social, and. You sent in a bunch of great questions on social. You sent in a bunch of great questions to our email. Some redundancy, and there's some specific themes here. A lot of people wanted to know about the Jazz. A lot of people wanted us to talk about the Cavs, um, some general NBA stuff. But I thought, Tommy, we could dive right in from one of our uh, 
OG listeners, Ryan Rucker, who's been with the old man in the three since the beginning, um, who sent in a, a very specific question for Tyrese. Ryan writes, uh, Caitlin Cooper from IndieCornrows.com, which you guys should all read this piece that she wrote. It's a great piece. She said she wrote about Tyrese's ability to dissect defenses from the air. Ty, uh, are you seeing any themes from defenses this year that you have not seen in the past? Uh, a little bit. Uh, just me being a primary guy now, I'm facing some different ball screen coverages that I've never seen before. A uh, little different approaches. Um, you know, whether that be blitzing ball screens um, at the level. Um, also, when the second unit guy comes in, that's the guy who tends to pick me up full court and try to tire me out. Um, so that, that's probably a little different, like being the full-time point guard versus last year it was kind of only for 20 games, whatever. It was kind of just in the flow of things where now, um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of different things. Uh, some teams are switching, but some teams are switching to then uh, sending the double and making me get off the ball. Uh, so, yeah, I've definitely seen some different things. But uh, Kate, Caitlin, who you mentioned, who is an awesome, awesome writer, she she pays attention to very little nuances in the game. And uh, that article she wrote on jump passing, I love it to death because my whole life I've been told not to jump to pass. And it's probably <laughs> one of my biggest attributes. So it was, it was a pretty cool article. There's certain people that can jump to pass. You know, I I talked all the time last year about Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and their turnover struggles, and they were always playing off of one foot. And then I sub, you know, uh, simultaneously called a Dallas Mavericks playoff game where Luca is driving right and jumping off his left foot in the air and then making sort of split second decisions. And there's just certain guys can do, can, that can do it. And a lot of times you need a little bit of a size advantage. So Tyrese, you've gotten off to an unbelievable start, 22 points a game, a little under 10 assists, five rebounds, ridiculous uh, shooting splits, 50% from the field, 46% from three. The one game you struggled was Brooklyn. And you only had 11 points. You didn't shoot well from the field. You had seven turnovers. What were some of the things they did that game uh, that sort of either sped you up or caused you to have those turnovers? Yeah, so t to be honest, the first Brooklyn game we played, I felt like I was in complete control the whole night. Um, I knew that Ben was going to start on me, so I knew to be ready for some physicality, uh, but that I could take advantage of that in some, in some different aspects of coming off ball screens, getting him to switch. He's used to chasing over guarding the best player at all times, so they switch everything, so I knew I could – uh, dissect guys on tags and rolls and things like that. The second game, Ben didn't play. Kyrie started on me, and we knew that they were going to be very physical because we had just beat them, and it was kind of two games in a row. You know you know how that is. When you play two games in a row, they adjust, and things were different. Things were different. And I didn't come out aggressive early, which kind of hurt. Um, for me, like, the best, the best part is to come out aggressive early because then that opens up everything, and I didn't do that early. And so Kyrie got into me, blocked a couple shots, got some steals, um, and then they kind of just fed off that. So I would say it's probably more on me to be, you know, to assert myself offensively early, uh, and I didn't really do that that Brooklyn game. So they, they, they did a good job. Kudos to them. Yeah, I, I should interject here about Kyrie because we've talked about this. I don't know if it was last week or um... – in one of our exclusive episodes on, on Amazon music, but he actually has done a good job of battling on the defensive end. Cause he's a guy that's one of those target guys, right? You know, he plays against Luca, he plays against Tatum and they're the, they're bringing his guy up into pick and roll. And by and large, he, he plays hard in the, in those one-on-one -on -one, uh, situations. I had a question on your third year now, um, having, you know, spent, a season and a half in Sacramento, half a season in Indy, uh, starting to feel comfortable with Rick Carlisle. Has the game slowed down for you? And if it has, how does that sort of manifest itself? Yeah, 100%. Uh, it's easy to say it, it's slowing down, but there's still aspects that I feel like, man, like when I go back and watch film, I'm like, wow, like I missed that, right? Like we played Miami the other night down the stretch. I'm so used to just calling the five into a high ball screen for, you know, uh, you know, we're up three, I think. And, and I'm, I got Max Struess on me and I'm waving Bam out of bio to set, the, to, to come switch. And I'm watching Phil like, why would I call Bam out of bio into it? You know? And that's, to me, that's an example of the game. The, there's still a lot of room to grow, to notice those things, especially in the fourth quarter. I'm used to running one, five pick and rolls. 
Now it's like, hold on, slow down. Who is the best defender for me to attack right now? Okay, wave him into the screen, right? And I, and I think that's a part where the game can slow down for me. Uh, but yeah, I definitely feel more comfortable out there. Um, and it's it's when you got the ball in your hand so much, it's like now it's like kind of trial and error of seeing what works and what doesn't, and uh, you know where you can be where you can be better. But yeah, I definitely feel like it's slowing down, and I'm getting more used to to different reads because like my rookie year and my second year was a lot of drop coverage. That's just what everybody played, and to be honest, that was due to being in the West. Uh, just like my division, or my our our division, like playing Kevon Looney playing DeAndre Ayton, I'm playing DeAndre Jordan or Dwight Howard, whoever's the Lakers big at the time. Z Zubach. Yeah. Zubach, yeah, yeah. yeah, right? Like playing those guys in the West. Now coming to the East, like Vucevic is at the level. Uh, I, haven't played, I haven't played Milwaukee yet, but you're playing Brooklyn more, playing Miami more. Uh, you're playing Toronto more. You're playing teams that are going to switch more one through five. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a transition to move into that and just kind of getting accustomed to it. But I love it because – when I was in the West, that was hard for me. Like that was really hard to play these teams that switched everything or were at the level. And now if I can get over that hump now, then when I get to play the teams on the West or teams that drop, it just makes things easier. I, I Real quick, Tommy, I just had, I had one more question about the game slowing down. Cause you know, I, I was flipping through games uh, the other night and I thought you had this uh, tremendous read against the Pelicans. So you're taking the ball out of bounds uh, and you guys are running a very high pin away for Buddy Heald. And on the first play, Buddy gets fouled. And on the second play, you find Jalen Smith in the corner. Can you sort of walk us through that read and how you found Jalen Smith so open in the opposite corner? Yeah, so we were running, obviously, a wide pin down for Buddy to come off and shoot the three. And I thought I saw Jalen. I thought I saw Brandon Ingram kind of creeping in. And his head was kind of turning both ways. So I threw it to Buddy. They called the foul. As they called the foul, I walked up to Carlisle. I was like, yo, I think I can throw this skip. Like, I think it's there. He's like, if you can make it, throw it. So I'm like, all right, I'm throwing it no matter what. I don't care if it's turnover or whatever. This is going there. So I just, as soon as I got the inbound, I just stared at Buddy. Just let it go. Jalen hit the three. Uh, looked at Carlisle, pointed at him. He gave me dap on the sideline. He smiled. <laughs> Uh, which is obviously very rare for coach to do. But uh, yeah, I think it's just kind of the processing part of it and and understanding uh, the, the reads to it. And like, I think what CP has done an amazing job of is he sees a coverage one time. Now he's like thinking how let's run it again. And I'm going to think about the second coverage, right? Like if you want a stack action and you guard it one way, he might tell you to slip out. Then you get a wide open three. Uh, I think it's just like the progression of like running the same set over and over to figure out the different reads to it. So uh, I think it just comes with it. Ty, I was going to ask before we get to the next question, just about the three point shooting in particular as of today. 46.3%, which is obviously a career high for you. Is there anything different or is it just, are you just seeing the floor well right now? No, I don't think anything's different. Um, I'm just more comfortable uh, shooting off the bounce this year. Uh, I spent a lot of time this summer working on ISO stuff, uh, working on one-on-one -on -one, uh, or just, you know, kind of shooting off the pick and roll. So, um, you know, for me, it's like mo all my shots, more, most of my threes these days are off the bounce versus my first two years, most of them being catch and shoot. So uh, just having to be prepared for that and then taking advantage when I do get those catch and shoot, like those need to be layups. They have to be for me because I don't get them a lot. So I got to take advantage when I do have them. Uh, but, you know, I just feel really comfortable off the bounce and uh, comfortable on my reads. And, you know, it's just making things easy. I think we asked you this question when we had you on the podcast, which was uh, the first time, which was about two years ago. But has anybody tried to change your shooting form other than me, other than me telling you need to jump on your three point shot. But <laughs> you know, I got to tell you a story real quick. So I, th there's this guy, uh, there's this guy I know he's, he's a lead singer. He's the main guy in this band. It's like a, I, I would describe it as an indie rock band. They're, they're fairly popular. So he's on tour <laughs> and he's an indie and he has an off day and he's, he sends me a picture and he's like pregame at your game. And he's like, you know, at pace, I think you guys are playing the Wizards maybe. Did you guys play the Wizards at home? First game of the year, yeah. Okay, so yeah. So it's the first game of the year. So he says to me, he goes, at Pacers Wizards, don't know any of the players. Who should I be watching tonight? And I was like, oh my God, Tyrese Halliburton for the Pacers. And he's like, all right, cool. So he texts me after the game and he's like, your boy is really good, but his shot is so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. No, nobody's trying to change it. Uh, I, I spent this summer with Drew Hanlon. It's my first summer with him. Um, and he was like, hey, I'm I'm not going to touch your jumper. He said that uh, he usually asks his clients, like, if, you know, if he should take on somebody new and uh, or if if they agree with him taking somebody on. So obviously I was new to him. So he said he was texting like guys like Jason and Brad and Joel, like, uh, like asking if he should take me on. And he said, none of them said, he said the first question all of them asked was like, are you going to change the shot? Uh, and Drew was like, I'm not going to change the shot. He shoots four times three, but we're going to work on like kind of speeding it up sometimes. So uh, we do that like more speed work than anything, but not necessarily trying to change the form necessarily. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, all right. We, let's jump into some more mailbag questions. Tommy, fire away. Um, from Miles Arena, he wrote this in uh, on email. Who are your guys' personal most improved players you've enjoyed watching so far? Tyrese, you can't pick yourself, and we're not going to pick you either. Ah, okay. Um, that's a good question. I will say I believe that most improved this year will be Tyrese in some sort of way. I don't know which one, but I think it will be one of them. Um, so Tyrese Maxey obviously is playing really well. Uh, I think he's going to take advantage of, you know, James being out of now being the full-time lead guard, like just taking advantage of doing his thing. Obviously he can, you know, score with the best of them. He's doing a great job. Uh, Laurie Markkinen as well. I think he's playing really well in Utah. I think that's a, a easy decision for people, but somebody that people not, not, also might not be talking about Devin Vassell from San Antonio has looked really good. Uh, we played against them. They beat us. He looks really good. And he 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 seems to be you know coming into his own, feeling comfortable over there. So Denvisa also another guy to look into. I like all those picks. I, you know, Tommy, I don't know why you said we can't pick Tyrese, but Tyrese certainly has to be in consideration ten games into the season for this. Um, so again, I I, I want to mention you know our exclusive episodes on Amazon Music, but we did a deep dive this week on Desmond Bain, and Desmond Bain is fascinating because last year. It wasn't for, you know, John Morant going, uh, you know, from a borderline star to a full-blown superstar. You know, I think there's an argument he could have been most improved player last year. I I would make the argument he's my most improved player this year. I mean, he's turned into a full-blown second star for Memphis. And the biggest thing, and I, I broke down the numbers on our exclusive episode, but the biggest thing for me is he's been so efficient out of pick and rolls. His, his volume has gone up out of pick and rolls, his scoring efficiency. He's like 94th percentile in the league so far uh, in pick and rolls. So Bain for me, and the other guy is, is Senjin from Houston. This dude is averaging fucking 17 and 10 in like 25 minutes a game in his second year in the NBA. Uh, like Houston is a mess. Don't get me wrong. Like, I don't think they're going to be anywhere near even the play in game. But there's a lot to like about their young players, and he's one guy that has has really stood out to me. I was going to ask you guys about about how does it matter how the team finishes or ends up because Shea uh, is another one, obviously, who's made a huge jump this year, and I don't know that that team is going to go anywhere, maybe by design, but he's probably somebody who will be in the conversation as well. It's interesting to me because I don't get the criteria of the award. It's, It's the most ambiguous award there is, I think. Like to me, there's no no way Jordan Poole is not most improved last year or Desmond Bain. Like Ja, amazing player, great dude. Uh, but like he's on a trajectory to be a star already. Like Jordan Poole was in the, the G League a couple of years ago, and like he was a very big part to them winning that championship. And Desmond Bain took a big step this year. So like it's weird because it's like, yeah, I want to say, like, yeah, winning most improved would be dope for me. Like, I would love that, but like. Like Devin Vassell, like Bull Bowl is getting like like rotational yeah. minutes now, and he's like you know playing well. So it's like, is it an award that goes to a guy who's not playing much, and they get those minutes and they prove themselves, or is it an award that goes to you know somebody like me or Tyrese Maxey or you know what I mean a guy who's taking a jump? This motherfucker is already pining for himself. Did you hear no, that? No, no, that's not pining. <laughs> this is why I said it. <laughs> This is amazing. You're like, you're like, why can't you say this? That's why. That's a it's real like, question, though. It's like Derrick Rose back in in the in summer of two, whatever it was, 2010, when Smart he's like, man. why can't I be MVP? It's a great question, Tyrese. It's a great question. Why can't it be you? Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Tommy, I want to fire this one up because you're you're pretty uh, bullish on these guys. So I, this is from Andrew Ramsey. Do you guys, and I'll answer this as well, do you guys consider the Cleveland Cavaliers 
who right now are in first place or second place, I'm sorry, but have the second best record in the NBA. Do you guys consider the Cleveland Cavaliers to be finals contenders? It's a great question. It's a great question. Tyrese, don't get shy talking about other I'm teams. I'm not shy. I'm not shy. You know I'm not shy, JJ. Um, I would probably say... Ah, it's, it's hard because in the East, you got Milwaukee, you got Boston. But let's let's say yes. Let's say yes, by the way, they're playing right now. It's easy to say that right now, but I, I still think that they could use... Like every team in the NBA could use a, you know, a, a Mikael Bridges, uh, you know, what I mean, a, an extra wing. Uh, but I do think, like maybe a J, like maybe a J Crowder, even. Hey, like a, like a, like a Mikael Bridges light. Yeah, know? good call, good call. I feel like they could use another wing of that sort. Uh, but backcourt wise, they're good. There is one of the best point guards, Don, one of the best two guards, and then I think you got. Um, you know, Jared Allen and Evan, Evan Mobley taking care of the paint. Um, I, I, I believe so. I believe they are, yes. I will sort of further your point and repeat something that I, I said recently, and that's just that I think they need a fifth closer. I think they need that wing. I think they need that 3 and D wing, which Karis LeVert, as good as he is, Playing with Donovan and playing with Darius sort of takes away his strengths, which is playing on the ball. And then I don't think Isaac Okoro, he hasn't really shown yet that he's ready to be that guy uh, who can who can sort of be the, the fifth guy on a championship level team. And that's not a knock on him. I mean, he's a young player. Um, and he he may get there, but look, they're they're fourth in offensive rating, second defensive rating, first in net rating after last night's game. Um, to me, they're legit. They're a legit team, and and yes, they should be considered finals contenders. And I know, Tommy, you probably would echo my sentiments because you've written about them like nine times on our newsletter. I'd say they're the second <laughs> they're the second best team in the East behind the Bucks. That's what I think. And I also told JJ, wow, I also over told, Boston, yeah, over Boston. I also told I also told JJ that uh, we were talking about this on the Amazon show. That's a piece I agree with that, but that's a piece that they can pick up in a trade. Like look at PJ Tucker two years ago. It's not like that's a it's not like you can't find those guys at some point in January or February. But it's just my opinion. I hear you. Um, this is a good follow-up question to that. Walter uh, Takodora writes in, who's your dark horse finals team? I'll answer this first. I'll answer this first. So Go ahead. I think there's a number of teams, by the way, that I could place in this category of dark horse. I mean, to me, there's not a favorite. Like, if I'm going to say a favorite right now, I would say, like, Milwaukee's my favorite to win the East. They're doing this. They look dominant defensively, and they're doing this without their two best shooters in in Chris Middleton and Pat Connaughton, and without their second best player in Chris Middleton. And they look dominant. So outside of Milwaukee, I don't know that I have, like, a, a like, firm finals contender list because I think the list is very long. But my team... <laughs> I'm just such a fan of the Memphis Grizzlies. I think they have the culture. I think they have the star. I think losing Kyle Anderson to Anthony Melton hurts, but I think they have enough enough depth to get it done. And I think when I looked at last year in that playoff run, what worried me so much was there wasn't that second secondary creator, that secondary playmaker, because Jaron Jackson's not that guy. Tyus Jones is, is a facilitator. To me, Desmond Desmond Bain has become that. I mean, he's averaging almost five assists a game and scoring almost 25 points a game or 24 points a game after last night, whatever it, was, whatever it is. And so to me, it's like the Grizz to me are the contenders to make the finals. They're the dark horse to me. Hmm. That's beautiful. I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna agree with that, JJ. Wow. <laughs> I'm gonna agree with that, JJ. Lee, you look at the West. I mean, we're early in the season, but you look at the West and the Jazz are in first place, and you're like, all right, how is this gonna play out over the course of 82 games? How's this gonna play out in the playoffs? And I'm looking at like sort of that internal development. And again, another guy we we talked about this week, Mikel Bridges. I think he's gotten better this year. He he's his his numbers are great, all career highs across the board. And so if you if you can get those second, third, fourth year guys to make that jump, and maybe it's an incremental jump on an already really good team, hey, that could get you over the top. Tommy, do you have a do you have a do you have an answer to that question? I'm very curious. I, yeah, I I I 
think a team that both of us underrated a little bit in our preseason picks is the Hawks. I think the Hawks are definitely a dark horse. I wouldn't say that I would predict wow. that they're going to get there. <laughs> wow. I just, I don't know. I don't think that deserves a wow. I, 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 what am I going to say? I, I want to throw a, I want to throw a team out there that we're not talking about. I want to be wrong that, on this. Tommy. I, think, I, I want to be wrong. on. I this. think that any question we had about those two guys playing together has been answered already. No question. No question. Any question of those guys, of those two guys playing together has been answered already. I think that they have a lot of guys in the team that have been there before and got very close to the finals two years ago, obviously. I'm not saying I would predict them to go, but I think they're going to be a tough out. I mean, I don't know if you guys watched them play Milwaukee the other night without Trey, but there's there's a lot there on that team. And so I just, I I think that they, I think for whatever reason, we were probably as guilty as anybody, they've been slept on a little bit in terms of like teams in the East that can make a run. And if you have two guards that can fill it up like that, they're they're not going to be fun to play against. I'm going to ju- we're going to jump around here a little bit because Tommy and I have a list of questions and we had to cross out like 15 of them because there were so many good questions. But I, I want to we're talking about teams right now, and I want I want to jump to players real quick. And so uh, at Pabs 14 uh, asked which player has been the biggest revelation so far. And I, Tommy, I want to, I want you to lead this off. Uh, what is what, what player has been the biggest revelation to you so far define, this define season? I don't want to Tyrese lead this revelation. off. I don't wanna... Do you want to define revelation? Because I'll look it up, Tyrese. I'm please, please it up do it. Right I now. dropped out of I dropped out of college. Please define <laughs> revelation. All right, revelation is a surprising and previous previously unknown fact, especially one that is made known in a dramatic fashion or the divine or supernatural disclosure to humans of something related to human existence. Yeah. Terry, I'll go second. Terry, you start. No, Tommy, you start. Go ahead. Let me hear you. All right. right. So my answer is uh, Siakam. But Siakam wow. Gonna, but I, Siakam like that. Was a, I like that answer, Tommy. But, but Siakam was, a, was an all-NBA player, what, three years ago? So, so he's not very like, nice. How is that a revelation? That's what I'm saying. It's not a revelation. I just think that Siakam right now, like I was just looking at the, at, at the specifics He's yeah, he's 25, he's 25, 9, and 8. I mean, his numbers are insane. I know he just got hurt, but his numbers are insane. So it's like, I think that that's a guy we did a pow with him last fall. We even talked about with him. People always sleep on him for whatever reason, but he's on a he's on an incredible pace right now. And so I guess in terms of revelation, that's somebody that just people need to talk about more. Okay. I'm gonna go with an answer that I've already said his name today. Lauren Markinen. I think he's looked awesome, but also like I played against him. I I played against him in Chicago, yeah, and in Cleveland, and I didn't see this. Yeah. Um, like it's it's fair, it. by the way. That's not I, a knock. Like it's not at solid all. player, solid yeah, player. Solid, yeah. yeah, solid. Like, uh, but he's looking. He's looked really good. He looked good in the summer playing in the you know with with this with Finland, right? Is where he's from, Finland. I think he was cooking over there, and he's cooking now. And like, I know. Uh, did not ex- like this is a, a step up from what I I thought he was capable of. So that's my answer. All right, you guys are not going to like my answer at all. And I, I know after Tommy's choice of Pascal Siakam, Tyrese is not going to like my answer to the question, which player has been the biggest revelation so far? <laughs> but, dude, I have to talk about this. The biggest revelation so far is how fucking good Luca is. Dude, l- these numbers are insane. So he's accounted for... <laughs> no, listen. He's accounted for... F- of his team's points, total points, whether he's on the floor or not, points at assist. That's not even including when he makes like a pass to somebody who gets fouled and makes free throws. All right, he's never shot over 59%. 58.7, I think, is his best true shooting percentage. He's at 63%. They have the slowest pace in the league. Luca dissects the defense. You know, he dissects the defense. Slowest pace in the league. He's averaging 50 points per 100 possessions. 50. It's insane. Eric Shapiro, Shapiro, by the way, uh, who's, who's on Twitter, put up a great video the other day of the Raptors game. They used 11 different coverages on him. Double teams, early blitzes, late blitzes, drop coverage, switches. He just dissects the defense. I took Knox to see him play when he had his 41-point triple-double against Brooklyn. And what's really interesting to me about their offense. So they play at a slow pace. They're not necessarily running plays for other guys, but he basically said, you don't want to, you don't want to fill Jalen Brunson's role. I got this. I'll fill that role myself. So when he's not scoring, 
He's drawing the second defender. And then Dallas gets into this beautiful ball movement. Zip, 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 open three. Zip, 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 back cut. It's actually, I hate isolation basketball. I do. I hate it. I couldn't do it. That's why I hate it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but watching them play is actually beautiful because you're taking someone who is arguably, you know, top five, top three, whatever it is, like one of the greatest talents in the world. And you're just maximizing, you're doubling and tripling down on his talent. And I don't know that that's good enough to get you over the top and get you to the finals and get you a championship by himself, but fuck, it's fun to watch, man. It's fun to watch. And the numbers back that up. You two both just said all NBA basketball players. <laughs> and like, I, I don't know how that's a revelation to you guys if I'm understanding the definition of the word correctly. Um, but, you know, yeah. kudos to both of you. They're both obviously great players. That's <laughs> fair. The NBA action is just getting started, and so are the incredible offers at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers can make any $5 NBA pregame Moneyline bet and get $200 in free bets if your team wins. And get this, right now everyone can earn up to a 100% boost with DraftKings stepped-up same-game parlays. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, place the same game parlay, and combine multiple bets like which team will win, total rebounds, total points scored, and more. I've had so much fun doing same game parlays. We've been doing them weekly on Wednesdays on the Old Man and the Three social. And I've been placing bets as well on these parlays. You've been getting pissed at some of these results. <laughs> well, they, they, they've been coming close to hitting. I'll just put that. The four-way parlays for me, that's where the that's where the fun is at. With payouts bigger than ever, DraftKings Sportsbook is where I go to bet on the NBA. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code JJ. Make any $5 bet this week and get $200 in free bets if your team wins. Only a DraftKings Sportsbook with promo code JJ. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, another fa- another favorite one. Danny at Struces Loose um, wrote in, uh, "Who's your favorite rookie based on what we've seen so far?" And I think oh. Paris, I, I think, think you, you can, can start, start off. off. Uh, <laughs> you can start this. Matter. You can start this one off. <laughs> Not a question. Who? Uh, you stop. Better don't than, be a homer here. What do you don't mean? be a homer? No, you're He's right, dude. That's what I would pick. He's the too. answer. That's what I would pick too. He's been amazing. This guy gets, this guy gets to the free throw line at. A, I, I don't know the stats, JJ. I would love for you to dive into those stats for me and figure that out. But this guy gets to the free throw line better than any rookie I have ever seen. Like he just lives there. It's like, like I told him early in the year, I was like, bro. Go play the four right now. I'm going to run the shake, pick, and roll and throw it back to you. And when you catch it, just catch it on the run and go to the hoop. You just go to the free throw line. Like this guy, get like in practice, in training camp, he was he was uh, going to the rim, complaining for calls and stuff. And like, they don't call him in training camp. But he, and, and I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, Ben, you think you're getting calls? Like, you're a rookie. Like, good luck. And I said that because I shot like not even half a free throw in my rookie year, a game. This guy gets a free throw line better than any rookie I've ever seen. It's better than that. I was going to ask you about his the pull up game. Are you like are you surprised at all at just his level of confidence for a dude that's played so little? No, I mean you guys heard the quote. He said Brown got to show him that he's one of the greatest players <laughs> yeah. ever. Like that's Ben. That's who he is. And the crazy thing about Ben is like you hear that quote and then you would think that he's just like this like arrogant like dude just walking around. Talk. Ben doesn't talk. He doesn't say anything. He just shows up and and plays basketball and like. He's a gamer. Like he might have a, like he'll have a, say he has a bad practice, whatever. You're like, oh, didn't look too good. Yeah, we get in the game the next day. He's first twenty five. It's like that guy's ready to go when it's game time. So I'm, I'm going with Ben. All right, JJ, talk about Paolo. <sighs> I mean, yeah, I yeah, accuse, you're I, you I know, accuse you're Tyrese. <laughs> Tommy, you know me so well. Just go. You know me so well. No, I, I, I accuse Tyrese of being a homer, and I, I'm talking about a Duke guy. But you can't deny the fact that this guy looks like the real deal. I will sort of admit where I was wrong. I said all last June leading up to the draft, every time I got on the air, every time we did a podcast, I thought Jabari Smith should have been the number one pick. Um, and I had seen Paulo play a ton because Duke is the only team I really watched. I'd seen him play six times in person. I think there's something to be said about spacing in college versus spacing in the NBA. And his ability to 
dominate one-on-one matchups is really impressive. I mean, the numbers are great. Um, just had back-to-back 30 pieces. But to me, at such a young age, it's the physicality. Like you saw last night against Houston, he had two bang on dunks, like body to body dunks. And he's got the handle. He's not shooting well from three, but I I just, I've been really impressed and I shit on the magic all the time. I think they, that, that regime since we left and we had all the success there, they have drafted fucking horribly. They have drafted horribly. And look, last year they drafted Franz Wagner and this year they got Paolo Bencaro and those are two foundational pieces. So credit to the Orlando magic. Um, I, I, I'm 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 happy for that organization because they have a foundational star in that in in Bancaro. Tommy, who's your guy? For a rookie? Yeah. I, um I w- I would pick Ben. I love watching him play. I don't have another one. I mean Keegan Murray's I think is going to be really good. He kind of tailed off a little bit. He's he's fun to watch too, but like I think that I don't I think that there's a pretty significant drop off between these two and I think that it's we should give them their flowers. <laughs> All right, that's I, fine. I have a, I have a another <laughs> similar no, I question. I want to ask this. the next question because I, okay. I have a, I think this person is a made up person. So Mike, Michael Tejada asks if you are having one breakfast food for the rest of your life, what is it? And I know my co host very well. And I don't think Michael Tejada asked this question. I think my note should say Tommy Alter. If you are having one breakfast food for you know the what? rest Some, of your life, sometimes we it? like to we like to pick questions to mix it up a little bit for the people that don't know every every specific <laughs> NBA thing, and they you know we can broaden our our audience a little bit. Terry, you go first. I'm rolling with eggs. Hear me out. Hear me out. I eggs? do. No, dude, bro, it's a that great choice. Even... It's a great choice, Tyrese. It's, it's a great versatile. Choice. Yeah. What do you you want? Sunny side up. You want scrambled? I just want a little more. I want hard. a little more specificity than just eggs. Personally, what do you? What kind of answer do you want? You want like huevos rancheros? Like huevos rancheros are the. That's sure. it. Wait, I mean, huevos, huevos rancheros, rancheros, rancheros are the jam. Huevos rancheros is a good answer. But you, but eggs, you, I, you I thought know. it was a one breakfast item. You said breakfast food. We have one breakfast food. One breakfast. I didn't write food. that. Michael Tejada wrote that. <laughs> Michael Tejada. <laughs> there's probably there's probably a person named Michael Tejada somewhere in this world. Definitely somewhere in this country. But he didn't write that, Tommy. He didn't write an email in to three four two general at gmail.com. Right. Hey, you okay. wrote that question. <laughs> All right, JJ, you're you're, you're up. <laughs> I don't really eat breakfast. I, I have my answer. With you. I have my but answer. I'm a black coffee guy. I'm a black coffee guy. But I'm <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Tyrese here because there are certain days. Look, there are certain days you want a waffle with some maple syrup and some whipped cream. You know, I, I do homemade for my kids. There are certain days you want pancakes. There are certain days you maybe want to. I'm a big bagel guy. Everything bagel with lox and cream cheese. Come on now, come on now. But. Day to day, you got to live with one thing the rest of your life. I need, I need an egg. I need an egg. Breakfast sandwiches. Come on, you can't make a breakfast sandwich without without an egg. You can't make the greatest brunch item of all time, huevos rancheros, without egg. Huevos. True. That eggs, is true. Tommy. Eggs. That is a, that is a so fact. I'm going to agree with Tyrese here. Tyrese knows my answer. It's, our, it's the spot. <laughs> it's Chia, seed. Chia seed. Chia <laughs> seed. Scallion, pancake, bacon, egg, and cheese. <laughs> Crazy. If you haven't went, go. You took Jade there. Immediately. Yeah. I took Jade there. Yeah. Where, and I took no. my mom there, too. We can't, We have to stop talking about it, though, because otherwise we're not going to be able to get in anymore. Yeah, that's, that's a, a fact. Point. Never mind. Don't tell people. All right. Do you have a question, JJ? I, I do. I, do. I, I got one lined up here. Uh, I think this is a good jump off back to the NBA <laughs> since we just spent... Three minutes talking about eggs. Alex Henderson, DPT. I don't know what that means, but at Hendo DPT sent this question in on our social. Uh, which player off the average fans radar will be an all-star even as a replacement all-star? And I, again, there's very ambiguous wording here. The average fan. I don't know how we define the average fan. We're certainly not talking about uh, the deep sicko NBA Twitter junkies. Um so I think we can be ambiguous here, but I'm I'm curious I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Tommy, because I have a guy. We've already mentioned him, but I have a guy. But I want to I want to hear your thoughts, Tommy. I'm biased because he we just had him on the show, but I think Jalen Brunson has a 
we'll have it depending on how that team does we'll have a case look at that face Tyrese you're up <laughs> why is it this your boy I mean I don't what's know what your case to, but what's your case to that I want to hear the case I will I will say that I will say that I love Jalen. Jalen's my guy. I'll say and I'm not num- saying he's not an also also liberal talent, I, I, but well, I want to hear your case to that. We also we also have to acknowledge <laughs> that our other person, our part of our show, is going to be an all star this year. Who we cannot pick, so he does not. He's the person sitting here with the white hat. We cannot pick, and you will probably make the team before Jalen. So uh, this is the this is the assumption you are already on the team. I think I think his numbers are good. He's like eighteen and eight. Um, I think that that team is steady. I think that that team is going to surprise some people. I think that they, I think by the, and I think by the time that, I don't know what, I don't know where they'll finish, but I think that the, by the time the all-star votes are tabulated, they will be in a position where they will be, if not in the playoffs, they will be sneaking around the playoffs. And I think Knicks fans want an all-star. And I think that they will, I think that they will rally around him. I've been to three games so far at MSG. They love him. I knew, we knew they were going to love him. What's not to love? He's an undersized point guard who's running shit in MSG. Like you think someone like that's not going to be popular? That your that reaction is like so over the top for what is somebody like we're going to check back in late January and see where we are with this. Okay. Okay. Um, for me, I, I would I can't say myself. So I'm going to say Shay. I, I get it. People watch. They know the numbers he's putting up. But an average fan not watching the Oklahoma City Thunder. No disrespect, but they got, you know what I mean? But Shea is killing. He's going to be an all-star for sure. So I'm going with Shea. And then um, De'Aaron Fox as well is having a really good year so far. Um, so one of, those, one of those guys. But Shea, Shea's for sure an all-star, and Fox has a, has a good chance. So one of those two. You're a bigger man than me, Tyrese. <laughs> You're a bigger man than me. Um, <laughs> actually, you and I are on the same page. <laughs> Wait, lo- wait, can I guess? Can I guess JJ's pick, Tyrese? It's not Luca. It's not Luca. Luca, 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 Luca might make the all. He might make the All Star team this year. Luca. Oh my God. Steph Curry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Tyrese. I put you in a bad position there. Um, Let's hear it. No, I, I actually, we're on the same page. We just picked the eggs, and I'm picking Shea too because I, I do think. The average fan is not necessarily t- tuning in to the three nationally televised games that Oklahoma City has on a Tuesday night on NBA TV. They're not watching uh, Oklahoma City versus the Sacramento Kings or Oklahoma City versus the Wizards, but you're missing a fucking show if you're not watching Oklahoma City with Shea in the lineup. 31 a game, six assists a game, five rebounds a game. In any given year, those are first team all NBA numbers. I mean, he is spectacular. He's such a good driver. He's efficient from the floor. And actually, I had a list. I had a list of sort of average fan. I'm just saying casual NBA fans. I had a list of five. I actually put a starting five together of my sort of all stars this early in the season. So my backcourt is a little fucked up because I have three guards, but my backcourt is Shea, Anthony Simons, Tyrese. And my front court doesn't have a center, but it's Pascal Siakam and Lori Markinen. I think those are the five guys that I look at right now. I, I mean, I spent 20 minutes on this earlier where I'm like the average NBA fan has no appreciation really for how good these guys are relative to the big names. And Tyrese, you will be a big name one day if you're not already there. I'm not, this is not a knock on you, but I think those five guys to me are just killing it this year. It's ter- Toronto seems like a big, like, come on, bro. People watch Toronto. You get, I love Siakam, but Toronto has this a lot is, of fans. This, he can't be they on that team. Siakam is an all star. He, he made 13 <laughs> all NBA last year, and we're <laughs> calling him underrated. Team, though, like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. I'm a hater. Let's say, hey, Tommy, ask the, ask the culture question. Cause I'm very curious to hear Tyrese's thoughts as a, as a third year player. And I have, I will have some input as well as a, as a 15 year vet, but I think that's a great question. Steven Schwartz writes, how much does culture matter in a locker room? Like how talented does a team have to be to make up for bad culture? Yeah. So I, I'm a, I can only speak on what I've been involved in my first two years. I played in 
a team, an organization with zero culture, being honest. Um, and I think the great part of coming to Indiana and, um, you know, kind of being called whatever they've called me since I've been here, the, you know, a guy that they're, that they see a part of the team moving forward, um, is I, I get to help build the culture here. Um, and, uh, actually a lot of it is expected of me. And, uh, that's, that's my favorite part about this so far. Uh, we're five and five right now through 10 games. That's the best 10 games start of my career. Um, and, uh, it just seems like we got guys who really enjoy playing with each other. Uh, guys who really have a lot of fun, you know, watching their teammates score, you know, have, ha just have fun seeing guys succeed so uh for me it's been it's been everything that's the only reason that we're five and five right now um you know it's and I, I still think that we you know we can be better um but for us it's like that's what we make whatever we don't have in size or skill or athleticism whatever we make up for uh by guys just like you want to you want to play well because like it's almost that you're almost doing the guys on the end of the bench a disservice by not playing hard you know what i mean like those guys come in, they're going to play hard, right? Like they want their minutes, like they're cheering you guys on 48 minutes. Like NBA games are long. Like nobody's trying to sit and clap for that long. So it's like, it's like you're doing a disservice by not playing hard for 48 minutes. So um, I think, I think it's huge. I think it's everything. I think it can really change the direction of organizations myself. It's a, it's a great point. I actually have a, a follow-up question to something you just said, but I'll answer this question as well. So I actually think, I actually think culture is sort of everything and it's hard to capture culture. It's hard to quantify culture. And I, I can honestly say I played 15 years in the NBA and I had four insanely enjoyable seasons where I was on a winning team with great culture. I played a bunch of other years where I was on a winning team with okay culture. I played on great teams with bad culture. Sometimes the same group that maybe a year prior had great culture. Culture is a very fickle thing and it can change year to year, even within the same group. And sometimes when you feel it, you have to sort of capture it and you have to like, just live in the moment. I, you know, I, I think about that first year I had with the 76ers we start out the season 14 and 18. We kind of knew something was there though. Like it was a good group. Brett was a great coach. Um, we went 38 and 12 down the stretch, won 17 straight games. We get to the second round and like it, we weren't a championship team, but that was one of my most enjoyable years. I had other years where like, Hey, we made the conference semifinals and like, fuck, that was a slog. You know, I had years where my one year, my first year in New Orleans, we didn't make the playoffs, but that was a really enjoyable group. Like I thought we were building a culture there. In terms of the second part of that question, which was how good do you have to be? How much talent do you have to have to overcome a bad culture? It's a conglomeration of generational talent. Like to me, culture is everything. Like if, if talent is to you, if, if you're building a team and talent is one, well, culture is 1A. If culture is one, then talent's 1A. Those two, go, those two are synony synonymous with building a great team. There's no way around that unless you have four of the top 75 players, unless you have three of the top five. Like, it's just, you, there's no way around. You can't cheat that part of team building. You can't cheat that part of winning. It, there's, no, there's no way around it. Hey, my question is, when you talk about that with culture, though, like, are we saying how much talent do you have to overcome that? What is overcoming bad culture? Is that getting to the conference finals? Is that winning a championship? What is, is it a uh, winning? It's winning at the highest level. Winning it's at winning high at level. the highest level. Right. Yeah. Okay. I have but a think question about this. Think about this. Let me ask you a question. You've, you've been in this three years and, and, and you may have a different opinion of this, but I've been on good teams where, again, I, my approach never changed. My commitment to my routine and my commitment to the game never changed. But there were times I was on good teams and I was like, fuck, I gotta, I gotta go to work today. And there were times where I couldn't wait to get to work. I couldn't wait. And th that's a difference. And you can feel it. You can feel it when you're in the moment. You don't, you don't get to May and June and look back and be like, oh, I enjoyed that. Or I didn't enjoy that. You know it in the moment. You know, look, you, you know this now, Tyrese, the NBA is just a series of highs and lows. An 82-game season is a series of highs and lows. And if you have a good culture, 
that can weather those lows. That can withstand a three-game losing streak. That can withstand injuries. That can even withstand, be honest with you, that can withstand blow, blow up in the locker room. That, that If you have the culture in place, you can keep moving forward. It's when that culture breaks down and resentment starts to build, that's when it gets fucked up. Has there been a team in the last 15, 20 years that has won a championship that has had uh, bad culture? I, I would say no. I honestly would say no. I, I don't think you can win at that level without a so, good culture. I, so my follow-up to that question is, um, you know, and I think we don't need to get into the specifics of certain recent things with different teams, but if you're in a situation where you have a team with very talented guys and the culture is bad, shouldn't your thing just be, just blow it up now? Because it's like, how do you, how are you supposed to win a championship when the culture is bad, I guess is my question, no matter how talented the team is. Tyrese is an active player, Tommy, so I'll answer this question. Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. You blow That's, it the fuck up. You just have to, right? Like, there's no other choice once you realize it's like that. Okay. So my follow-up question, because Tyrese kind of touched on this about how much he's enjoying this season and coming to work. Uh, this is actually a really good question for, from at for his frame. I don't know if this is a business, but um, or maybe it's just a person. But um, how much do the early season games speak about the team's capabilities? Um, so Tyrese, again, from your perspective, short career, I'm just curious in terms of your experience, whether it's a hot start, uh, bad start, whatever it may be, how much do the early season games matter in the long run? I would say it's interesting because sometimes I feel like those early, like first three, four, five games, it's like, I'm, it's like, damn, we're still in the preseason. Like this is ugly basketball on both sides. So it's, it's hard on like those, those like super early ones. But what I will say is that I feel like you can see flashes of things that like where teams can succeed. Like for me personally, I think we're number one in the NBA in pace right now. Uh, that's my, that's that's me. Like, I just, I want the outlet as fast as possible. I'm trying to throw the ball forward and run after it. Like take one dribble from the free throw line and get, get all the way, you know, to opposite three point line. Like that's what I'm trying to do. And I think that we have set early. We were like, all right, guys, we're going to play with an unbelievable pace offensively. And we're going to get enough stops to where we can play in transition as much as possible. Um, and we did that throughout the preseason. And I think we did that throughout early in the year. And now it's kind of a, establishing an identity on both ends. And I think that takes some time. Um, but, but for me, it, it's, it's more about seeing the, the pluses. And, and I think that if you're looking at it the right way, you can see the areas that you're going to, that you're going to need to get better in like right now, like right now, understanding like this is what we have to do better uh, for us early. And it's like hard, right. To take stats, like, we're, I think we're 28th in the league in defense right now. Well, that's because in the first five or six games, teams shot over 50% from three against us. And like, I don't know if that's a defensive thing. I don't know if team we're just playing teams that are hot. Uh, but like, I'm not buying that we're the 28th, but we're, I'm not buying that we're the third or whatever, third worst defense in the NBA, second worst defense in the NBA. I'm not buying that. So I'm not paying attention to negatives like that. But what I will believe is like, I believe that we're going to be top five in, in pace the whole year. I believe that we're going to be able to score. Like that's not a concern of mine. Uh, but I think you got to take you got to take certain different things to an account, and it's all got to be a read of how did you guys look in training camp? How did you look in preseason? How are you looking in different aspects to to take those into account? Yeah, I think first of all, I mean, you guys have beat you beat Brook, Brooklyn at Brooklyn, you beat Miami, you beat New Orleans, you've lost to some teams that maybe are on the same tier as you in terms of uh, preseason predictions, if that's fair. To answer the question, I think there's a there's a few things here to consider. So number one, there's schedule imbalance. Um, a, a team may have a, an easier schedule, and generally speaking, when we talk about like strength of schedule, you know there there may be some mass you know massive indifferences at the start of the year, and that sort of evens out by the end of the season. Uh, there's the home road imbalance. Yeah, was, you know, you you may play seven games of, in your first ten at home versus other teams that maybe play seven games their first ten on the road. Um, there's the injury imbalance. You know, generally speaking, let's say your best players are gonna are gonna play sixty five to seventy five games a season, and and maybe they've missed seven of the first ten games. So I think those are the things to consider. My viewpoint as a player, and it's still my viewpoint now. 
I look at the season in quarters. And so you can you can sort of start to get some definitive takes on teams after 20 games. By 40 games, you have a clear understanding of who teams are. If a team hasn't changed outside of some very specific, you know, um, historical anomalies in the last 20 games, between 40 and 60, by game 60, you know who teams are. And then, then it becomes like injuries or, um, you know, very massive schedule imbalances in the last 20 games. So I, I look at it that way. Like I look at 20, 40, 60, 80. If you guys are 500, Pacers are 500 after 20 games, hey, all of a sudden I'm pretty bullish on your team. I don't think that's in the best interest of your team going forward, but that's whatever. Um, <laughs> but so I, th- and I, I, I think, I think that's the job of general managers. That's the job of owners. That's the job of the front office is to take all these long-term views and not sort of live in the moment. Cause it's very easy. It's very easy to live in the moment. Um, I got a new question from at M Murpho. Uh, what young players do you guys think will be like the, PJ Tucker, Pat Bev of this new generation? Me, I'm going to say Tari Eason uh, out of Houston. Uh, JJ's laughing. He might say the same no. thing. Uh, <laughs> but this is the thing. No, because literally in our very first newsletter, a farewell to takes, our newsletter, farewell to takes, our very first newsletter, he was the guy highlighted. So I'm just, go ahead. I'm just saying, like, I think I, we did not text beforehand, Tommy. We did, we did, not, we did not text before. Tarisen is getting a lot of love. <laughs> I think he's the wing that, like we were talking about, the he's the archetype that your teams want. Everybody wants a wing like that that can guard multiple positions, that can sort of be like this three and D type of guy, uh, can do the dirty work, you know, when you need it, uh, and and things like that. And I think, like I read a John Lucas quote the other day where he said he's Dennis Rodman, but he's better now. Okay. <laughs> Pump the brakes. That's like one of the best players ever. But I think that you're seeing the trust that the that the coaching staff already has in him. He had obviously a really good preseason. Uh, but I do think that that's something that will work really well. And I think if you pair that already along with uh, Jalen and Sagoon and those guys and have a guy like that, I think that can help. So uh, I'm going to say Tari Eason. Well, so my answer is somebody I've also written about in the newsletter who has not actually had a great start to the season – and that's Jaden McDaniels. Uh, but I think in I think moving forward in his career is going to serve in this role because he has the ability to guard five positions. And I think he got a lot of, I mean, he said this in interviews and things like that. He's gotten a lot of his mentality from Pat. Like he's learned different things from Pat about how to approach the game and everything like that. And so I think even though he's had that team has been sort of up and down to start the year and he's sort of been up and down. He's fouled out a couple of times. I think that if we look back five years from now, he'll be somebody that we look at in a in a similar role. I like that. Right. I like that answer right there. Uh, yeah. I was going rookie. I was thinking rookie, but yeah. I like that answer. So for me, both these guys are on the Pelicans. And when I think about PJ Tucker and Marcus Smart and Pat Bev, those, those archetype players, like it's, yes, there's some shit to them, but the, the actual benefit of being in your face, an instigator, not backing down, applying defensive pressure, willing to take on any matchup. Like that's what I think about. I don't, I don't think about the antics. I don't. And so these two guys don't necessarily have the same sort of antics, but to me, it's, it's Herb Jones and Jose Alvarado. Like those are the type of guys when I'm building a team, when I'm thinking about building a team. Yeah. I want a shooter. Uh, actually I want multiple shooters. I want like four or five shooters. I want a playmaker. I want a rim protector. I want three and D guys. Like I want all that. But I want guys that are unselfish, that don't care about scoring night to night, that are willing to take any matchup, that are willing to change the pace and the energy and the spirit of a game. That's what Pat Bev does. That's what Marcus Smart does. That's what PJ does. They're willing to take on any matchup. They're willing to inject their own spirit and energy into a game. And that's what I see from Jose Alvarado. That's what I see from Herb Jones. That's why I like the Pelicans so much this year, because I think the pieces around them, like, again, team building, you've got two all NBA level talents and in Brandon Ingram and, and Zion, and you've got shooting in CJ shooting in Trey Murphy. You've got a big guy who rebounds well in Jonas. 
I love those two guys for Memphis. All right, Tyrese, these, these mailbags are always fun. Uh, I should have given you a heads up on this, but I don't want to put you on the spot on this. But our last question is from Jason Schaefer. Tyrese, has somebody ever talked shit to you and it was so funny you had to tip your cap to them? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> and be pl- a player or a fan? Either one. Nah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm trying to think of... Uh, I'm trying to think. Let me... T- I, I'll tell you one of the ones that I was like... The ones that I was one of the most confused by. Like, I was like, what? We played the Timberwolves last year in one of my first games here with Indy. I think I had 25 and 15. Like, I had a, I had a good game. Right? And Ant and, and, and guarded me. Um, but after the game, Pat Bev is barking. Because they won. And I'm like, what? And Buddy didn't have it. He guarded Buddy, but I got like four points. Like, I'm to a good job. Whatever. He looked at me dead in my eyes as I'm walking off the court and was like, you lucky I wasn't guarding you tonight. I would lock that shit up. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, we played four quarters. You could have switched to the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth. He went, and I was like, and that one, that one hung on me like all the way when I was driving home. I was like, what is he talking about? Like, that was one that stuck with me. Like I was confused. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if anybody's saying when I was like, that was all right right there. I don't think so. I don't remember a, a player really saying anything to me that made me tip my cap to them or even a fan. I mean, there, there were certainly some funny things. I, I've said this a million times, like the greatest sign I ever saw um, was my sophomore year at Maryland when somebody had a sign up that said, JJ drinks his own pee. I thought that was clever. I thought that worked. Um, there was a fan, there was a fan in Charlotte who was sitting courtside and this was, I, this was my first year in Philly. And so I'm in year 13, like at this point, unobjectively, I'm one of the greatest shooters of my generation, right? It's not like, that's not really up for debate. And it's early in the first quarter. And this guy all of a sudden, actually, I take that back. It's my second shift. I hadn't scored my first shift. So the second shift, I'm back in with like, you know, four minutes to go in the first quarter. And the guy's like, you can't shoot. You're not a good shooter, JJ. You suck at shooting. And I just, I like, I like blacked out. I went on a burner. I went on a burner. I had like four threes in the last three minutes of the first quarter. And I hit this ridiculous buzzer beater. Where like I'm turning the wrong wrong way as I'm running to the corner, and I did one of you know the quick the quick ones, you catch and you just shoot and you don't even hold your follow through up, and it went in at the buzzer, and I'm like talking shit to him, and I don't know that was the weirdest one I ever heard. I, I didn't tip my cap; it just pissed me off. Like <laughs> <laughs> there was a there was a guy there was a guy early in my career, and at this point, like I'm a rotational player, I'm averaging like ten a game on the Magic or whatever. And he's calling me a scrub and a bum in Atlanta, sitting courtside. And I remember being like, you must not watch the NBA. Like, there's such an underappreciation for people like me, like role players. Like, I'm not a fucking bum, dude. <laughs> like, I'm not a scrub. I love, I love, by the way, Tyrese, I don't know if you have done this yet, but talking shit back to fans. Oh, it's an amazing feeling. All right, mailbag was always great. Uh, appreciate Tyrese doing that with us. Uh, we have not done a draft in a very long time, and so we thought we would be, bring back the OM three draft. Tyrese has always been a um, he's always been a controversial drafter. Me, everybody, everybody <laughs> knows. Everybody knows Tommy can't draft. To put it mildly, so we thought Tyrese learned from the best. We thought we would have a very open ended draft. We thought we would have a very open-ended draft. And so, Tommy, what is what is today's draft topic? We're drafting people named Chris. <laughs> this is Jason, our head of production, talented, extraordinaire, came up with this topic. It's just Chris's. We're just drafting Chris's. Therese, you're up first. Okay. Um, first pick, because I really have a different first pick, but I don't think either of you guys will take them, I'm going to go Chris Evans with my first pick. Mm. Captain America. Captain America. Just named Sexiest Man Alive by People Magazine. Mm. Mm. It's a good one off the board first. It's a safe number one pick. All right. Um, my first pick, just because I would like to make um, my co-host mad today, is I'm going to pick Christopher Nolan. <laughs> I knew you were going to fucking do that. 
I knew you were going to do that. One of the great directors. You know of, crazy? One of the great directors of all time. What's crazy about that is I knew you were going to do that. Not because we have talked about this. Not because you told me you were going to do it beforehand. But Jason and Kylie and I, we all said this motherfucker is going to draft Christopher Nolan first, just to spite JJ. And yes, Christopher Nolan was number one on my draft board. So I Terry, think he's there's an opportunity now. later just because I want, I just want, no, no, I was prepared for this. Believe me. I was prepared. Believe me. I was prepared. I, th I think just because you did this, I think there's an opportunity for the first ever draft swap. I'm willing to give you two picks later in the draft. I'm willing to only have four and you have six. I still think my Chris's will be stronger than okay. your Chris's. Let's revisit. I'm just letting you know See, that. That's what that's a good pick right there. Crewing capital off this. Because you got two. All right. I mean, it the it's obvious here. I, I, you got to go with Thor here. Chris Hemsworth, to me, he's the sexiest man alive. And then I'm going to also say Christopher Walken. I mean, Christopher Walken is an OG actor. Shout out Deer Hunter. He's an iconic character. One of the best SNL guests ever. Those are my two. Walken's a great. That would, been, that would have been my number one in normal circumstances. Um, I'm willing to trade, Tommy. We'll talk. All right, number two, going um, friend of the show, friend of Tyrese's, going Chris Paul. Mm, okay. I get two picks. Yep. All right. I'm going with Chris Jenner. Mm. That originally was going to be my number one pick. Good but pick. I had that on my board. Unbelievable empire she's built. For so sure. I'm going, I knew somebody was going to draft Chris Jenner. I knew. A lot of respect to her. A lot of respect to her. Yeah. And uh, for my next pick, I'm going to go with Ludacris. Does that count? Yeah. Controversial. Definitely. Chris Bridges. That definitely counts. All right. Ludacris. Yeah, great pick. So this is, this is where, so Chris, I, I don't want to be controversial here. Chris, just the name Chris, if you look up famous Chris's, it's a very, it's a very white. It's a very white <laughs> name. Yeah. And you've already got a, just an incredibly eclectic list of draftees. I mean, you've done well. Chris yeah, Jenner in the well. second Chris Jenner in the second round is a little bit of a reach, but it's a, a reach. good top five pick. Yeah, I think he probably so. got more followers than everybody. Yeah, but followers aren't everything. You know that. I don't know about the second round pick. We're talking about legacy here. Okay, but I like it. I like it. I like it. I like my picks. Okay, all right. Third, I'm going Chris Farley. God, your your picks right now are so predictable. Like I knew you were going to draft Nolan as soon as I passed on Chris Paul. I knew you were going to draft him. <laughs> And then I knew you were going to draft Chris Farley just now. Okay. It's unbelievable. All right. You've left me in a tough spot. You've left me he's, in a really tough he's spot. He's really flustered. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking shit. Just trade, just trade picks for next draft, man. I don't right. know. But I think I mean, I'm I happy got, with look, who I am right now. Look, I'm... I mean, easy pick right now in the third round. Easy pick. Like, no doubt, Chris Rock. Easy pick. Yeah, that's why I was going on pick four. So then, then we get... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I should have picked Chris Rock instead of Chris Jenner because you guys were gonna let Chris Jenner fall, but keep going. And I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna pick a personal favorite of mine. Just like this is a pick for me, because I think I have a lot of good Chris's on the board. <laughs> I have a lot of good Chris's on the board for the fifth round. <laughs> so I think I'll find good value. But I'm gonna pick Christoph Waltz here in the fourth round. I think he's one of the greatest actors there is. And He's got some iconic characters. So I'm going to go him with the fourth great, round. Great character actor. I agree. It's a good pick. All right. I can't believe this is here in the fourth round. I feel like this is I'm just running up the score at this point, but I'm going Christian Bale. <laughs> Dude, you know what's so funny? You know what's so funny? Is like, I if you said to me, outside of Chris Hemsworth, if you said to me, can you pick your top five? You, you've picked four of my top five. I've literally picked JJ's favorite people on earth. This is the, this is Chris the, Paul. Tyrese, this is, this is what the problem is with going third every fucking draft is I get the, the short of the stick here. All right, Tyrese, you got two. Bale shouldn't have lasted to the fourth round. That's it. That, he's a borderline first round pick. I'm going Cristiano Ronaldo. Wow. Good one. Good one. Wow. Um, and, Fifth pick, um, Chris Duarte. 
Okay. I don't like it. So that you, like this it. is this is why I say this is why I say you're controversial. Because you and Mikel, you and Mikel always do this. You, you, and you, always, you both always do this when we draft. I, I could have went. I could have went. Um, don't say it. Don't, don't say you're it. You're not going to draft. You're not going to draft them. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. You're not okay. Just you're wait. not going to draft. You have no idea where my head's at just right wait. now. I you <laughs> I know your you your head is not where mine is in this pick. All right, fifth pick. I got a filmmaker. I got an NBA Hall of Famer. I got a SNL star. I got a great actor. I'm going to go Chris Kringle. Okay, Santa Claus. I think that's pretty good value in the fifth oh, round. Somebody boo but, this man. I think that's pretty good boo value. Santa Claus oh. in the fifth round. I see where Tyrese's values are picking Chris Jenner second and booing Santa Claus. Who boos Santa Claus? They're probably gonna make you dress up as Santa Claus at some event this year. And I know the truth. Kind of like you never said it. <laughs> I was desperately hoping that no one would pick Santa Claus. I really was. I was. And and Kylie and Jason both suggested that I someone pick Chris Kringle. But all right, I've lost this draft. It's all good. I'm gonna go with a personal choice again. So back to back rounds of that. I'm gonna go with Christina Milan. I'm, that's that's my fifth round value. There you go. Here are some names that I went undrafted. Christina Aguilera, undrafted. Undrafted. Chris Pine. Chris Pine is an underrated Chris. I wasn't going to pick him in my top He's, five. He's so very of good the, actor. Of the, of the star Chris's of, you know, you talk about Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Pratt, Chris Pine. Chris Pine wasn't even on my board. He's he's freaked me out too many times. Um, my my undrafted Chris's that I, I just want to mention, Christopher Plummer, an OG Chris actor. Christopher Mintz Plass, uh, McLovin. Right, we all love McLovin, and no, you, you guys won't get this, but Chris Christopherson of the high, you know, the, the the famous song, the Highwayman. I mean, come on, yeah, it's one of the greatest songs ever. Harris is just staring into the Chris <laughs> Chris Angel, <laughs> Chris, <laughs> Chris Angel, <laughs> Chris Everett. How about Chris Everett? I was thinking about Sam Tyler. We've talked Chris about this, JJ. I don't know celebrities. <laughs> Chris Kamen, Chris <laughs> Bosch. Chris Chris, Chris Catan. Chris Kamen. If Chris Kamen makes the top 15 of Chris's, we've picked a wrong topic. Put Chris Jericho on my honorable mention list. Chris Jericho. Uh, like all right. Always like fun, it. Tyrese. We appreciate it, bro. Yeah, appreciate you guys. All right, later. later.